Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the August 2nd edition of Digging Into the BI. We had some technological problems where three of us were all having trouble getting stuff together, so we apologize for that. But we think we have everything set. We do have four stock presentations for you tonight. It's Danaher, Intuitive Surgical, Alphabet, and Catalyst. And that's the order in which we will present them. We start in the upper left and go around clockwise. So we have uh, we have all this, we're ready to go. And let's go to our next slide. And this is our standard disclaimer. Uh, again, we're doing this for educational purposes only. Um, you know, we, uh, none of us are professionals. We're asking everyone to sort of do their own analysis. We are gonna be discussing stocks, not just the four that we present. And we, uh, we may have them in our personal portfolio. We try to let you know where we have it like that. But if we're showing you anything outside of the BI stuff, it's uh, not uh, supposed to be an endorsement or a promotion of those products. It's just the way we use things to be able to help get things organized for us. Let's go to our next slide. <coughs> so we are better investing. And... Uh, as you can see with this, uh, we're a, a long-term educational organization. I see most of you are, are regulars uh, here, so I'm sure you're in the Better Investing community. We say this so that if people see this up on uh, YouTube, uh, because this will be put up there later, is that they'll know sort of something where, where we're coming from. And so the other thing I wanna be able to point out is that third thing is that all of us are volunteers here. None of us are professionals. In fact, we're showing our amateurness because we had trouble getting started tonight, but that's okay. We'll get through it anyway. Next slide, please. Um, we will be recording this. That is our YouTube page there. Uh, it's digging into the BI. Um, and all of these things that are underlined are hyperlinked. So if you get the handouts, you will be able to go directly to those locations. We ask you when you have the webinar there, uh, when you go to that website, please make sure to like the individual um, uh, presentations or recordings, as well as subscribe that helps with the algorithm. So that allows us to be able to reach more people. Those things would be appreciated. Next slide. Um, again, if you're having trouble like we were with some of our technology, there are some places up in the upper right-hand side that can be able to sort of help you sort of figure things out. Uh, one of them would be if you're on your computer and you're not using the computer audio um, and stuff like that, you are muted during all of this. And that green uh, arrow there points to where the handouts are. So please make sure if you're here live to be able to download the slide deck, uh, they're in a PDF, as well as the four completed SSGs that we're gonna talk about tonight. Uh, you can share those with other people if they couldn't get here to this uh, thing. Anyway, next slide. So why are we doing this? Well, we're we're doing it to be able to sort of help beginners that maybe are uncertain with their judgments, but also it's a chance for us to be able to do best practices for a long-term fundamental investor like us in the better investing community. And this is a joint program from our two uh, our two chapters, the Maryland chapter and the DC regional chapter. DC regional includes Montgomery County, Maryland, DC, and I think almost all, if not all of Virginia. We do have some model clubs in the area and uh, we do have a visit a club program, but there's a little modification that we'll talk about in a little bit later. And this is designed for people in the mid Atlantic, but if you're calling to us from outside of Maryland, DC or Virginia, welcome, we're, we're glad you're here. Next slide. So in just over an hour, we're gonna be able to present four stocks, the monthly stock to study, the monthly undervalued feature, and then we'll have two more that come from uh, stuff that have been found either from our website or the magazine. The purpose of this is to be able to show you stock ideas that you can get just with your BI membership. And those are some of the other places that you can get it. And also if you have it from personal experience. Let's go to our next slide. So you can be able to find these stocks if you, uh, and you don't even have to be a BI member if you go to Better Investing and you'll see at the top of each page, we have uh, betterinvesting.org, that's the location. You can uh, click on this hyperlink and we'll take you to Home About Us and the news releases. And you can see this one, uh, the news release was announced um, 
on the uh, 26th of July, and that's uh, Danaher and Alphabet. Let's go to our next slide. Um, and you can uh, make sure to get future announcements if you go to the My Account part in the uh, right there, or up in the top of the red circle, you'll then be able to uh, come down there and you go to the email and product subscriptions, which I've highlighted in the green circle, and that green window over on the right will open up. And from there, you can be able to sit there and tell them that where that arrow is for local chapter news and stuff, and then you have to hit save changes. However, before you hit save changes, it's good if you go on up there and get the BI weekly newsletter. And let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about that. So this is for members only, and it comes out around the close of business on Thursday and it talks about all the different events that are happening in the overall community. And if you have signed up for it and you don't get it, I'd check your spam filter. But there are some interesting things coming on up with the uh, um, with a, a, a webinar that's coming up uh, in the future. And then also some stock ideas. I, I sort of highlighted uh, one that was dealing with screens that are kind of worthwhile. So go ahead and take a look at that. And next slide. And you can also connect with us, either the DC Regional or the Maryland Chapter. Those are our, our links there. You don't have to be a BI member. Uh, you can just show this to someone who's interested in our way of investing. Um, I know we've had some regular conversation on the DC regional page, and it's been promoted by some other some of the other chapters around us. That's great, and we're uh, glad you're doing it. So stay in touch. Let's go to our next slide. And also the Maryland chapter has uh, their own BI meetup. This is something that all the chapters can have. It's sponsored by headquarters. Currently, there's nine different chapters that have these things. It's free. You don't even have to be a BI member. And it's an opportunity to be able to do stuff there um, educationally. So there's the link for the Maryland chapter right there in terms of some of their stock uh, investing education that's going on. And we'll uh, uh, just take a look at that. You, again, you don't even have to be in Maryland to be a part of it. I'm, I'm in a couple of Mountain California. Next slide. Um, so here's some of the things that are going on in the Maryland chapter right now. They're going to have, on October 21st, they're going to have an in-person SSG class. That's going to be from 9 to 2.30. Uh, it's going to be down at, uh, at in uh, La Plata. Um, at the, I think it's the College of Southern uh, Maryland, if I remember right. Uh, and you can register there. The cost will vary whether you're, I believe, a county resident or not. So uh, take a look at that. But the information is there when you do the registration. Um, it, you know, if you don't live uh, in that part of, of the world, it can be kind of far to get to. But again, some people really like having an in-person one. It's a great way. The instructors do a wonderful job. Keep that in mind if that's something that uh, you're so inclined. Uh, let's go to our next slide. And Cheryl, why don't you tell us about what's coming up in the DC chapter? Did we lose you? I can't hear you if you're there. Hi, um, every month the DC chapter puts on a um, Money Matters book discussion. Um, and you don't have to necessarily read the book. The person who usually is in charge puts out great notes, um, but it is from the third Tuesday of the month from 7.30 to nine. Uh, the next book that was going to be discussed is The Long View, Revisiting the Four Pillars of Investing by William Bernstein. And please come and join us. It is virtual and there is a link on our DC chapter local events. You can see up the top, uh, you can get the link to join in. Very good. Let's go to our next slide. And why don't you tell us, uh, Cheryl, about the uh the SSG class that we're doing here in uh, the DC chapter? Well, uh, you are going to uh, be able to attend this virtually. It's going to be held on two consecutive Saturdays. The first one starting on October the 28th from 9.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. And the next one is the following Saturday, November 4th, for also the same time. And again, you can get the link over at the DC chapter events. Uh, it, there is a small charge for this. It's um, 
20, either $20 per session if you only want to attend one or the other, or $30 for both of the sessions. And you can again go to the DC chapter and you will see the button there for registering. And please join us and uh, your uh, instructors will be Kevin and I. Maybe we can even loop Jonathan in on that one. <laughs> anyway, uh, so we want to feature some of the clubs that are helping to put this on tonight. So I'm part of Happy Destiny, which is a Maryland chapter. Uh, we uh, There's a picture of us at our, uh, our, our summer, late summer, uh, I should say early summer, late spring uh, social gathering. Um, so we meet on the third Friday of the month. So we'll be doing October 20th. We're looking at Northern Nordisk and we still don't quite know what our uh, education is going to be. It's going to be a mystery topic. So anyway, but if you want to attend that, just send an email to that point of contact at digging into BI and we'll get you in touch. Next slide. Uh, this is my other club. This is the Montgomery County Model Investment Club. Uh, we started in 2017. Five partners. There's more than five in that photo, and that's because we did a summer social with uh, Pinnacle uh, Group Investments, uh, and because one of our members is in both, and it's a great way to sort of connect with each other. And so we're on the third Wednesday. There's the link to be able to go, free and open, virtual. Um, and we're going to be looking at some more of the My iClub features, and we're going to be doing ResMed as our stock study. Next slide, please. To you, well, Cheryl. One of, one of the other clubs that I belong to, besides Happy Destiny with Kevin, is the In Model Investment Club of Northern Virginia, otherwise known as McNova. Uh, we started in 2008. We currently have 12 partners, although we're looking to welcome in another partner. Uh, the next meeting is October the 10th. Uh, it's the second Tuesday of the month, and that's when we normally meet every month from 7 to 9 p.m. Again, this is also online. There's the link for you to join in. Uh, the education is going to be using the BI stock screener to find great stocks in uh, traditional industries. And the stock to study is Cummins Incorporated. And I'm back to you, Kevin. Okay, and let's go this. Greg, why don't you tell us about your club? Sure, I'm a member of the Washington Metro Investment Club. The uh, club was started in 1992. We currently have four, 40 members, including five student partners. We usually meet the third Saturday of every month. Meetings go between three to five. If we're lucky, they usually run a lot over. Uh, this month's stock uh, study will be Charles Schwab. Uh, and we have our meetings are uh, in person and via Zoom. I participate via Zoom. I'm currently in the Rochester, New York location. Uh, that's where I live, in the Rochester, New York area. Very good. Glad to have you. And you. Uh, um, Cheryl, tell us about this new program. Okay. Um, it used to be called uh, Visit a Club, and they had a listing of clubs that um, we're looking for members, new members to join, and now they've expanded it and they call it Club Connect. And it's for BI members, clubs, and, and people who are using that 90 day membership program. So it's really opened up to a lot more people, uh, officially started back in September. And it's supposed to be more proactive on connecting clubs with potential partners and BI members with clubs looking for new partners. And this would also work for individual uh, investors who are looking to um, share their knowledge with the club. So the decision to join a club or not, as well as accept a new partner, still remains with the club and the potential new partner. But it is, as I said, expanding the, uh, the audience of who can join in. Back to you, Kevin. Okay. And so uh, since this is digging into the BI, here's the latest from the Better Investing Magazine. Um, again, you can look at this either through the e-magazine or the app. Uh, of course, you can wait for it to come in your post office. I've asked periodically whether people uh, use the app and most people don't, but uh, most of us still prefer having a piece of paper in it. But if you have these options, you can be able to sit there and watch it on your laptop, computer, or smartphone, um, which can be helpful. Uh, go paperless. Anyway, let's go to our next slide. And 
some of the information from the learning center, like if you want to be able to get uh, the mobile devices, that's a green arrow over on the left. And yeah, it's a different uh, sign-in process than it would be for, for your normal one. So go ahead and um, uh, click on that and it'll sort of walk you through it. Um, the uh, other one, the red arrow is, that's where a lot of the detail stuff for the featured stocks, the undervalued feature in the stock to study can be there. And that's just a good place to find them. So let's go to our next slide. And featuring one of the stocks, or one of the stories that's in there, the random walk column. I found this was kind of interesting. They, you know, towards the, the this is the last paragraph of this two uh, two page story. And it's that there's a tremendous value in doing research, reading the annual reports, and studying the industry, listening to calls, and building those models. And those sort of give you sort of a an understanding of what's going on. It's um, um it just uh, it, it just sort of helps you to try to understand things a little bit better. So anyway. Um, that's really it. Let's go to our next slide. One of the other things we're doing is um, we've had quite a few uh, clubs from either Maryland, D.C. or Virginia that have been recently featured in the BI magazine. So what I wanted to do is when uh, a club from our area is featured, I wanted, wanted to be able to give them a slide and a little bit of a shout out. Um, so this is a, a column called the Better Investing Family column where they talk with Angel McQuaid who does a book review and they just sort of tell you stuff about what's going on with their um, uh, with their club and stuff like that. I found it kind of interesting. They have their own Facebook page and they have their own uh, fantasy contest uh, for, for portfolio. So kind of interesting. Uh, we can maybe reach out and get them to, uh, to come and participate with us here. Anyway, let's go to the next slide. And here are some of the events that uh, are coming on up. Uh, South Florida has uh, Learn to Earn, where they have uh, uh, free online uh, stuff. They have one on the 14th coming up, but they've been doing regular stuff there. And then also uh, Puget Sound, that's the Seattle area. Uh, they have their annual um, investor education conference at the end of this month. Uh, so I don't, I couldn't tell. You'd have to look at the registration, whether it's in person or whether it's uh, online. But uh, go take a look at it. That's really it. Let's go to the next slide. And here are the two stocks we're going to look at in core. It's first going to be Greg doing Danaher, and then I'm going to do Intuitive Surgical. So, Greg, over to you and tell us all about Danaher. Thank you, Kevin. So, Danaher is listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and this stock was a stock that was featured as part of the uh, BI Stock to Study in our October 2023 uh, magazine. Next slide, please. So what do you know about Daniger? It's an American uh, globally diversified company that designs, manufactures, and markets, uh, markets life sciences, diagnostic, environmental applies solutions, products, and services. So they employ over 81,000 employees at 29 operating companies. And they have four large segments, biotech, life sciences, diagnostics, and environmental and applied sciences. Their growth is fueled primarily through acquisitions and they have uh, you know, R&D, and they actually have facilities in over 60 countries. Next slide, please. So they originally uh, started out as a Massachusetts real estate company that was investing in retirement homes. They reorganized in Florida in 78, and in 84, they became Dan Hurton and reorganized in Delaware because everybody knows Delaware has <coughs> laws that are very favorable to uh, business. Uh, so Danaher was named after a creek that the two brothers, Mitchell and Steve Rails, used to fish at. Next slide, please. So Danaher Business System, this is highly touted in the industry, and they basically have kind of five uh, tenants. The, the best team wins. Customers, they listen to their customers. Uh, innovation defines their future. Kaizen is their way of life, and they compete for, for uh, shareholders. So usually when you deal with a company, you're looking for a mission statement or something like that. We do this for these reasons. Danaher, when I went through their, their annual stock report and online and different presentations, they do not have a mission statement. And I guess their strategy is to basically make money for their shareholders, which they do utilizing their system, enhancing their portfolio through uh, strategic uh, um, acquisitions, and then attracting and retaining exceptional talent. Next slide, please. 
So what did 2022 look like for Danaher? Very good year, 31.5 billion, uh, core revenue growth of 9.5%, uh, 60.2 gross, gross margin, uh, free cash flow of 7.4 billion, which is really good. And, and they've been making a, having free cash flow, which exceeded uh, their, um, exceeded their net income for over 31 consecutive years. So obviously they're strong when it comes to money. So it's not a company that we're going to anticipate going broke anytime soon. Next slide, please. So this is kind of a breakdown in terms of the four major segments. So we have the um, by, by, by uh, diagnostics is, was the biggest chunk with five, 10 billion. Then comes uh, biotech, which is uh, uh, 27.8 uh, percent, 8 billion. Life sciences is 7.0, and then the, uh, the the run of the bunch is the environment, environmental and applied sciences. And so when we look to the right, it talks about like basically the breakdown in terms of most of their money it comes from research and medical products. Uh, the next is analytical and physical instruments, and then product identification. Next slide, please. So uh, what is what is like Q2 looked like recently, uh, the numbers didn't look that good. So their revenue was down, gross profit was down, gross margin was down, market cap is down, net income was down, and EBITDA was down as well. So, you know, even though they're strong in terms of cash, they're having, they're beginning to see a, a dip in terms of their overall growth. Next slide, please. And so when we look at this, this kind of gives you an idea of what the stock looked like. So in 2018, it was 107. Uh, dollars and we see a high water mark of about 300. And actually, I think the high might have been 303. And then uh, as of September 28th, it was $248 per share. Next slide, please. So this is kind of a historical, how do they ma match up it against their competition? Uh, Danaher is actually the blue. They were at 31.1, so the third one down. Uh, Fisher Scientific is at the top. So they do pretty well. And when you begin to kind of look at the trend lines, the trend lines are kind of generally about the same, that everybody had a big peak right around 2019, and then they're going up, and then you begin to see kind of a leveling off uh, going into 2021, 2022. Next slide, please. So here's the interesting part is Danaher is going to be spinning off their environmental and applied sciences solution, which makes up about 15% of their revenue uh, so that's to me a big chunk. Uh, they anticipate it's going. They uh, many investors or analysts are high on it, saying that uh, Veralto will use the same Danaher business uh, system to generate profit and revenue, and so they're very excited about this new opportunity. Danaher is saying that they're going to spend this off so they can focus primarily on their health uh, care business. Next slide. So uh, here is sales and earnings. So when we began to look, I predicted the historic uh, estimated growth is 4.4%. Uh, the historic uh, sales growth has been 4.9%. Uh, and we began to look at their historic earnings is 10.2 and estimated future growth per, uh, per share is 4.7%. And so we began to look at like the, the three lines, the uh, pre-tax profit, the earnings per share and the um, sales, we began to see that all of them are beginning to take a dip right about now. Next slide, please. So here's a market evaluation. One of the things that I really like about this was the uh, pre-tax uh, profit on sales. We noticed that it continues to rise, uh, but we're beginning to see a slowing down in terms of its growth as we're going into 2022. And then when we look at the uh, debt to capital that's going down, but and we look at their return on equity, it's kind of flattened out as well. So, you know, you begin to say, hmm, things are beginning to change a little bit right about now. Next slide, please. So here's kind of the earnings, or price earnings uh, uh, history. And so when we look at the, again, the, the bottom line is the average uh, price earnings ratio is about 33 and then the current ratio was 29.2, which are, you know, very, very good numbers. So, you know, we have, it's very good numbers, solid company, but we begin to see that there's kind of a slowing or a flattening in terms of their expansion and their growth. Next slide, please. And so what I did with this is I took out like the COVID numbers. And when you began to look at it, in particular, when you look at the summary, the historic sales are minus 7%, the 
historic earnings per share is minus 1%, and uh, uh, percentage debt to capital is uh, minus 302%. And then, of course, we have to take out those numbers, and when we look at the end, when we go back a couple of slides, we notice that their, their debt was going down. So, you know, we, we can address that, but it's interesting when you remove the COVID numbers, uh, which uh, BI talked about, it's almost as though they're just kind of um, moving along and just making money for their stockholders, which is what they want to do. Next slide, please. So I'm saying that, you know, when I do the analysis and crunch the numbers, in the end, I'm saying, while well, it's a solid company and they will continue to be profitable, uh, I'm saying hold uh, their, I have some concerns, particularly when you look at the fact that they're spending off 15% of their business uh, they, they are, they're predicting like, a, I believe for 2024, 1.4% uh, didn't de decrease, which I'm thinking, well, that means you're going to come up with another 14% in, 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 miss, in miss business. So I guess they may have a couple of companies uh, that are billion dollar companies in the hopper that they're looking at or currently uh, planning on buying or they're just simply don't want to, be, you know, bring that degree of bad news for, for risk of it impacting the value of their shares. Uh, next slide, please. So again, the five-year potential. Uh, again, it looks, um, you know, predicting an annual dividend of about 0.4% uh, uh, current yield. Uh, we're looking at uh, uh, average using long-term long is 0.5%. And so the numbers, uh, again, annualized rate of return is about 4%. So the numbers are pretty good but it's still not, you know, the kind of numbers that would make you want to run out in the middle of the night and buy this particular stock like that woman that's buying that ice cream. Next slide, please. So my conclusion is uh, down here, it's, it's mixed. Uh, some analysts uh, have expressed concern because of the spinoff. Uh, many analysts believe that the continuing utilization of their business system and strategic acquisitions will align it to uh, its core health systems and will continue to power the company's growth. I think it will grow a lot slower than it has in the last couple of years without COVID. But then, you know, people are talking about the resurgence of COVID, so maybe they might get uh, lucky again. But my recommendation is that we hold. Okay. And then we look at this slide as it is in terms of the maturity bubble. I think it's more on the mature side, and that's early, early maturity because I think there's some growth left, but not a lot. And I don't look at Dan as being an explosive stock. Okay. Thank you very much. You're All welcome. right. So now we're going to talk, uh, the second one in core, I'm going to do, it's going to be intuitive surgical. And I'm going to show you how I found it through an online uh, study screen. And it's also something that's pretty well known in our community because it's in the top 100. So what I did is I wanted to be able to find something in healthcare. Um, and when I did that, I, uh, I sort of talked to some of the people in my clubs and were saying, okay, what are some of the things that we liked? And we sort of zeroed in on medical instruments. So just by going into healthcare and searching under medical instruments, I'm down to 60 stocks. The ones that were the most interesting were ResMed, Intuitive, and Lamaitre Vascular. They're all instruments, but one is lung, one is surgical, uh, robotic surgeries, and the other one is vascular. If you want to understand more about how to do sort of an industry study this way, this ticker talk that Ken Kavula did in May is a really good and simple way to be able to sit there and find the best ones in a particular industry. So I suggest going over it and it's uh, only about 10, 15 minutes long. So you can make it your education segment for your club to take a look at. And I found it really kind of worthwhile. Let's go to our next slide. So what I did is I, I zeroed in on Intuitive Surgical. It's, uh, well, it's a medium sized company. It's in the S&P 500. And uh, like I said, it's in the medical instruments. Sunnyvale is uh, the Silicon Valley area. And really what uh, they've done is they're the originator, they're the pioneer of robotic surgical machines. The one that they use predominantly is Da Vinci. I had that on the first slide there where I showed their three main products. Da Vinci is the one that does that. Um, there are other ones that look pretty good. Or the other things that are worthwhile to take a look at is that it has a Morningstar financial health grade of A, and it also has, um, Morningstar has a wide mode and exemplary capital allocation. And that uh, uh, generally in their entire universe, only 8% have both of those when I did this screen. So it's clearly something that's really, really good in that area. 
And if you look in the upper right-hand corner here with Intuitive, um, they did 18, uh, 1.8 million procedures on their DaVinci machines just last year, 13 million overall since they started in 2000. And um, they have also, um, uh, they have, they've added 1,200 new machines in, uh, in this last year, 8,000 overall about 5000 in the US big growing market in the um uh, in the outside outside the US so let's go to the next slide and let's talk a little bit more about this so i don't really know much about uh, i i barely made it through science in school um i'm uh, i don't consider myself an expert in it but i wanted to understand more and they have i found this really interesting story uh, uh, from mass devices don't know much about them but they sort of talked about some of the six surgical um, robotics companies that are kind of interesting. And that hyperlink, that underlying is a hyperlink that will take you to the story. But some of the ones they talked about were Intuitive, Medtronic, Johnson & Johnson, Stryker. Those are some of the ones I sort of zeroed in on with them. But there are a whole bunch of other ones so that if you're interested in this field, that's a way to maybe start looking at some of them. I have no idea what they look like on the SSG, but you can certainly take a look and see what they're like. Let's go to our next slide. And so a little bit more about the robotics industry, the screen capture on the left-hand side, that's Statistica. They're a German-based company that does a really good job of sort of outlining um, a lot of sort of macro issues in, in the business and research area. And I, find, I, I use them as a good source. And if you look at that, it went from like 62 million in 2000, I think that's 11, I'm having a hard time reading it, old eyes, and it's going up to, I can't tell if that's 100 and, uh, 120 million in in uh, 2030 is where they're estimating. So that's sort of, you know, I don't know where they're getting their information. But over on the right-hand side, another site uh, of researchers were saying that they thought the global surgical market, uh, which was at basically 80 billion in 2022, is going to be about 189, 190 billion in 2032. So that's a growth rate of about 9%. And then Another site was talking about with NIH uh, that robotic surgeries have went from 1.2% 1, 1 of all surgeries to now 15% in 2018. So it's a really showing a phenomenal growth in this entire area. Let's go to our next slide. Um, so here's one of the things uh, to be able to keep in mind. It's uh, we're, we're sort of in, intuitive sort of fits in there. Well, they were the first ones to do a robotic surgery. It was actually in uh, Belgium, because it wasn't FDA approved here at this time. It didn't get FDA approval until 2000. But what they what they have is they, they have these machines, a, a machine, Da Vinci, um, and they have patents on this, and a lot of them still stay active. So being at the cutting edge in terms of a lot of these things is really important for them. And here's the thing, is that on the side of what they call their customers are basically hospitals or institutions that buy these machines. And these machines are anywhere from half a million dollars to two and a half million dollars. And so these are not cheap machines. But what happens for them is that uh, if a hospital has it, is that it, it uh, leads to less time on recovery so that the person can be discharged sooner uh, and the like, because you're not cutting them open. They're not uh, 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 the threat of infection is really, really low. So this really helps in terms of speeding things up and moving people through the hospital or whatever facility that are in. Let's go to our next slide. So here's the other way that Intuitive does it. I, I really like finding, when I can find a good Motley Fool story about a company I'm looking at, because they usually, not always, Motley Fool will have a uh, someone who really does a nice job of sort of explaining what the industry does and how they sort of fit in in sort of simple language. So I always find that really quite useful. And if you see the hyperlink there for this Motley Fool article, here's the thing that goes on with it is that, um, but as you can see, 79% of all their sales are reoccurring. What that means is they sell the machine to the, say, the hospital. But then what you're going to do is you're going to come, you have a contract with Intuitive where they sit there and they do an annual maintenance. You get all your supplies through them. So this really becomes almost sort of a classic pick and shovel play. Pick and shovel being sort of like the people that made money in the California gold rush were not the people that were buying the gold, it was the people who were selling them the pick and shovels. So they get this reoccurring revenue that's coming on in. 
and it really sort of helps. And if you see the the revenue trend there in the lower right hand, that's from Intuitive Surgical's own company presentation. You can see the darker blue is their reoccurring revenue. And Intuitive sort of separates things into, they first did stuff with urology and prostate, then they moved on to gynecological, and then they called general. So that's basically how they sort of divide things up, you know, boys, girls, and then sort of general. And that sort of lets you sort of see how they sort of structure things going on. Let's go to the next slide. And if you can see some of the growth opportunities where they think it's going to be is in this general surgery. This is bariatrics, hernia, and the like. That's where they'd use a machine called a Da Vinci. They also have, are, are branching out into pulmonary and bronchoscopy. If I'm Hopefully I'm saying that right. Uh, that is, uh, they use an ion machine. And again, that first slide on my presentation will show you an image of that. And what they're really seeing is that this huge growth that's going on, and they think it's going to continue forward. Again, the earlier slides were showing you the growth that was happening in, in uh, robotic surgery. So keep that in mind. Let's go to our next slide. <coughs> so here are some of the competitors. <coughs> the, the thing is, is that if you look in the lower left-hand side, that's the stuff we usually get from, from Better Investing. And they're not, I don't necessarily look at them as being direct competitors. In fact, if anything, there's probably none of them that are really a good direct competitor because um, Intuitive really dominates the market. There are other people that do robotic surgeries and that market that we were talking about for robotic surgeries is not just what Intuitive can get, but those are a whole range of other things that are going on. But Medtronic sort of gets in there with um, with it as a competitor. Um, Stryker is robotic surgery, but they're more on the orthopedic side, and that's not where Intuitive is. Intuitive, like we said, is in gynecological, they're in urology, they're also doing stuff like gallbladders, hernias, um, and stuff like that. So they they're also do some uh, cardiac stuff. So that's sort of where they are. So it's really kind of tough to find a good direct competitor, but Peter Lynch says in this, that that's actually a good thing. It means that they have a, a corner of the market and that coincides with what we said at the beginning, this has a really wide mode. Let's go to the next slide. And so a lot of people, when you're in core, they say, oh, I can't really see that front page like we see in plus. Well, you can, what you have to do is you have to go to that, uh, that third stop I have there. Just to be able to help you read this, anything that's highlighted in green tells you where you are. So I'm in core SSG, I'm on the first tab, analyze growth, and the third step, which shows the visual analysis that most of us are used to in plus. And as we can see, those are up straight and parallel lines. You don't get the pre-tax profit, but you do see really good consistency. And that's consistent with what we've heard all along that this is a well-run, or this uh, has some really good metrics, a financial health grade of an A and the like. So it just confirms what we've already seen. Next slide. So if we look at some of the stuff here, and I put in Abbott, Stryker, and, and Medtronic as sort of their competitors. And if you look at that, the black one is uh, on this graph is intuitive. But if you see that this is based on size, so you can see that intuitive is, uh, is uh, seventh the size of Abbott, a fifth the size of, of Medtronic, and about a third the size of Stryker. Uh, but it has the best sales growth rate. And so you can really get a good feel for where they are. But again, um, there's not a, a really good direct competitor, but these are probably the best that we can do, but they're really much larger and much bigger than where uh, Intuitive is, even though they're all in the S&P 500. Next slide. We can see this also with the earnings. Um, again, a little bounce on with Abbott, but again, all the others have really decent numbers. Stryker, Abbott, and, and Intuitive all have decent uh, a growth rate, so we can feel pretty good with that. Next slide. The pre-tax profit margin, this one higher is better, and if you can see that that the, this is clearly the best is with Intuitive. The one thing you have to take a look at is you see those last couple of years on that black line, the pre-tax profit margin's coming down, and when we go into the end, and I'll show you this with the audit, it's gonna show you that, oh, maybe we have to be careful of this. While they're coming from such a high number, and even at the low end, they're still somewhere around, you know, 30 to 50% better than any of the other people on a pre-tax profit margin where higher is better. So that's a really, really good sign. And I'm not worried about that dip. Next slide. The return on equity, they're all decent numbers. I would have expected a high growth company like uh, in 
intuitive to maybe have something that was, you know, in the high teens, maybe even the low twenties, maybe even higher. This one's at 14. It's okay. It's not great, but it's, it's definitely acceptable. And all the rest of them are pretty much in that same range. So it's not nothing necessarily something that's troubling, but I just would have thought they would have been a little bit higher. Anyway, next slide. Here's where they really shine. They, the bottom one there, lower is better on debt to capital. They have like almost no long-term debt and they have like 6 billion in cash with a B. So they're very, very liquid and they can be able to move on where they have to. Um, and so you'll be able to take a look at this. And it really shows how much strong and a much stronger financial position and that gets to their financial health grade of an A. But again, everything is telling me this is good. Next slide. All right, so what I estimated, uh, I did 13 and 15 for sales and earnings. Those are pretty much right around where the consensus are. And that's pretty much, after doing all my reading, I felt those are pretty consistent numbers going forward and I can live with them. In fact, the earnings may be a little bit on the low side because of some of the growth we're talking about, but I felt those were reasonable numbers. Next slide. All right, now here's where we sort of get to some problems. As an explosive growth company, they generally, explosive well-managed companies that have really good lines like that they're gonna you're gonna have to pay a premium for them it's no different than you know wanting to move into the good neighborhood you're gonna pay a premium to get into there so it's gonna have a high pe these are really really high seven i'm estimating a future high pe of 70 and yes that is high the fact is that if you think that that isn't there you can look at some of the historic ones and say well maybe i can even do 50. again using our methodology 50 is really really high but again, think about what this company is doing and the growth that's going on in there. You're going to have to pay a premium. I don't think you can keep it in that 30 range and stuff like that. Look at the last couple of years where there were 90, 70s and 90s. So yes, it's high. Caveat, uh, you may want to drop it a little bit lower. But just to give you an idea that this is what you're going to have to do when you get a premium, well-managed company in a growing and exploding area like surgical robotics. Next slide. And the same thing with the low price. The low price, it's this stock has gone up 55% in just the last calendar year. Um, and so the thing is, is that if I do things like the, the low price option for a growth company, or if I use a 52 week low, I'm gonna get an upside downside ratio that really has this really, really low. So I ended up setting it at, at about 70% of the current price. Normally a growth company, I would do 80, but because I sat there and gave it such a, high number on the high PE, I decided that I would sort of temper things by giving myself a little bit lower on the uh, uh, on the low price. And so that sort of balanced things off. Anyway, that sort of tells you where I am. Next slide. So that gives me an upside downside of 3.9 to one. And you can be able to sort of see that it's not like a screaming, screaming buy, but it is in there. I don't know what else to say other than it, it looks good under that stuff. But again, the caveat is that I'm using a really, really high PE. If you drop that, it's definitely going to be a hold. Next slide. Five-year potential, it doesn't pay a dividend. What it does with that cash is it makes some acquisitions, not many, but they end up, uh, you know, they've kept it on the books and the like, but, but they don't pay dividends. So what they do is they'll buy back their stock. Um, so that's one of the ways they do it. That's where the way Warren Buffett does it as well. And it's quite common, it's really kind of tax efficient. You get a 16% return. Again, that's based on a really, really high PE. If you don't agree with that, you're not gonna get this at 16%. Next slide. So here's the audit. We've talked about some of the things here. Um, if you see it, the, the, the management evaluation, they're saying be careful of that pre-tax profit margin. I think I've addressed that already. The biggest concern is the one I've already talked about is that this is really, really high. I think that's the biggest problem with this company is that it is, it's so good and so, so, um, so much in a growing industry that you're paying a premium for it. And if you don't wanna pay a premium for it, then you're gonna have to wait for it. And that's sort of where it comes down to it. But there's nothing to matter with the company, the industry or the strategy in which they have. Next slide. So I have it as an explosive growth company, very well managed, no debt, um, and stuff. You may look at some of those pre-tax profit margins, but I'm not worried with something that has the exemplary capital allocation. But I do think it really is overvalued. I had to use a 70 PE. The current PE when I did this this weekend was 73.3. 
and the five-year average was 51. If I go down somewhere in the 50s or 60s, this is going to you know, be a solid hold. If you want to be patient, I understand. Just wait for it. But just realize you're never going to get this if you wait for a PE of 30. It just isn't going to happen. So this is a good candidate, I think, for a watch list um, and to be able to keep that in mind. So I am done. Thank you very much. And let's go to Cheryl and tell us all about Alphabet. everybody recognizes uh, the old name of Google and uh, it has been changed to Alphabet uh, for very obvious reasons. You look there on the graph below and you can see all the different companies that now make up Alphabet and it's not just uh, the tried and true search engine anymore. Um, so the Better Investing Editorial Advisory and Securities Review Committee selected Alphabet because stock's valuation may represent an opportunity. The undervalued company goal aims to increase 20% total return within 18 to 24 months. Alphabet stock price at the time of selection was $129.66. The current price is 131.85 for GOOG and $130.86 for GOOGL and the stock has split into uh, um, two different entities, but they are still pretty close in the price. Next slide, please. Uh, with the November 2022 release of ChatGPT, which is a chatbot program employing generative artificial intelligence, the information technology industry has a new tool and a new set of challenges. Alphabet Incorporated is among the tech giants racing to incorporate ChatGPT. Wall Street may have concluded, however, that Alphabet wasn't quick enough off the mark introducing BARD, its entry into the competition. Microsoft got a head start with its chatbot version. Belief that Alphabet got off to a slow start may have contributed to the stock's six-month slide starting in late 2022. Suggested members of the Editorial Advisory and Securities Review Committee, members contended Alphabet hasn't fallen behind, however. Next slide. Major pieces of Alphabet include the traditional products, which we talked about, and Google X working on big breakthroughs, Fiber, providing super fast internet. Google Ventures, which are bold new company funding. Google Capital, which is investing in long-term tech trends. And Nest, investing in smart home products. Next slide, please. Currently, there are 43 regions operating across the globe including a DMV branch in Reston, Virginia. Next slide. Google Services, the segment primarily generates revenue from advertising through Android, Chrome, hardware, Google Maps, Google Play, Search, and YouTube. Other sources of revenue include app sales, digital content products, hardware, and fees received for subscription-based products such as YouTube Premium and YouTube TV. Google Cloud, the cloud segment of, is comprised of Google's infrastructure and data analytics platforms, collaboration tools, and other services for enterprise customers. The majority of the segment's revenue is currently generated from fees received for Google Cloud Platform Services and Google Workspace. Other bets, the other bets segment is comprised of a number of different operations that are not individually material. Some of Alphabet's other bets include its autonomous driving business, Waymo. Most of the segment's revenue is generated through the sale of internet services as well as licensing and research and development services. The segment reported revenue of 1.7 billion and an operating loss of 
$1.08 billion in 2022. Next slide. The transformational cloud plays a large part in the future of where funds are allocated and a projected key source of future revenues. And it's cut, up, cut into by data cloud intelligence, open infrastructure cloud modernization, collaboration cloud, which includes hybrid workspace, trusted cloud cybersecurity, and it's a global network 34 regions live, nine regions announced, 103 availability zones, and 22 subsea cable investments announced. Next slide, please. Now, cloud marketing is still in the early stages. Um, that's why in that previous graph, it wasn't a big part of the revenue. The growth being driven by new businesses and technology needs such as primary business drivers of rapid digital transformation across industries and new technology needs such as data and analytics, AI-driven processes, multi-cloud, hybrid work, and cybersecurity. There's also the emerging customer needs, and these are the top 10 tech initiatives driving IT investments in 2022, and you can see those for yourself. So the top customer needs align to where Google is spending their money. Next slide, please. This is their strong financial momentum. Uh, you can see there's the quarterly revenue. We're starting from quarter two to 2019 to quarter two 2022 was a 44% CAGR increase from 22.1 billion to 6.3 billion. Then looking from 2018 onward, you can see their public services spending versus the uh, annual revenue that is coming in. And so definitely cloud is becoming a larger and larger use of that money coming in. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a slide that I found um, on looking through Google, uh, we're seeking Alpha is saying that uh, Alphabet is their top stock for 2023. Um, one of the things that I thought was very interesting is their free cash flow. This is in basically a discounted cash flow analysis. And if you look down at the bottom, uh, that unlevered free cash flow is basically a cost of capital, which is that WACC number of 8%. Uh, WACC is the weighted average cost of capital, and it represents a firm's average after-tax uh, cost of capital from all sources, including common stock, preferred stock, bonds, and other forms of debt. It's the average rate that a company expects to pay to finance its assets, and it's a common way to determine the required rate of return because it expresses in a single number the return that both bondholders and shareholders demand to provide the company with capital. A firm's WACC is likely to be higher if its stock is relatively volatile or if its debt seems risky because investors will require greater returns. It's the discount rate that a company uses to estimate its net present value and a low WACC, which 8% is, demonstrates that a company is not paying as much for the equity and debt used to grow its business. The, uh, and their companies with low WACC are often more established, uh, larger and safer to invest in as a demonstrated value to lenders and investors. By demonstrating long-term value, the company is able to solicit funding at a lower cost. Next slide, please. According to the latest value line sheet, Alphabet Incorporated is a possible triple play. The current PE ratio is below the average annual PE ratio, as you can see from the PE ratio, follow the arrow down to uh, 25. Uh, the 2026 to 2028, the left-hand side red box, is the annual total return projections that are between 10 and 16%. 
with the net profit margin increasing. And that net profit margin is that bottom piece uh, with the blue arrow outlined in red. Also, uh, Value Line is saying that their high quality, timely shares offer broad appeal, uh, not just in the near future, but out to 2026 to 2028 as well. Next slide, please. Manifest Investing, a subscriptions. No, we missed a slide there. Go back to mana one slide. No? Hmm. Okay, never mind. It got messed up there. Okay. Um, among the other four top uh, technical stocks, all are up and straight and, pa and have increasing sales numbers with excellent growth for a large company. Next slide, please. Again, looking at the historical earnings per share, all four companies have excellent earnings per share, pretty close range together. Uh, and again, great growth for large companies, which is usually somewhere between five and 7%. As you can see, all of these companies really go beyond that. Next slide, please. All of the peers have excellent pre-tax profit and sales, high 20s to high 30s, and return on equity numbers are also in an excellent territory for a five-year average. While Apple has a return on equity of 98.4%, it also has the highest percent debt to capital, which bears closer examination. Alphabet has the lowest debt to capital, even though they are also growing by acquisition. Next slide, please. Ah, now we're back to the manifest investing. <laughs> okay, manifest investing, a subscription service that also focuses on fundamentals, has an excellent quality rating of 97 out of 100, a sales growth forecast of 13.9%, and a net profit margin of 24.5%. The graph below shows a consistent quality rating in the high 90s. The projected annual return, which is the PAR line, has been dropping since October 2022 until July of 2023 when it started rising again. The green price bars are dropping and the purple relative return mass is dropping below 10%. According to the list on the right, Alphabet is among the top five in both sector and industry. Next slide, please. Okay, we're looking here at the SSG front side judgments. You can see that the graph lines are up straight and parallel. Uh, also put in there a purple line, which is the free cash flow. And we can see that is very strong as well. Price bars increased until 2021 and started to decrease or fall in 2022. And also, if you look at that last price bar, which are the black eye bars, you'll see that little red uh, dash across that it shows that it's also near the top of a 52 week high in uh, 2023. Next slide, please. Uh, this is looking at quarterly growth and, oh, no, it's not. Hmm, sorry about that. Uh, the high price to earnings ratio is consistently trended around the high 20s to the mid 30s with an average of 29.8%, while the low PE range is from mid teens to low 20s with an average of 18.7. Next slide, please. With the stock price trending lower, uh, I used an average high PE of 28 that resulted in a fair um, high price of $265.70. I kept the average low PE at 17.7 that resulted in a low price of 83.50. I upped my final low price to $92, which is 70% of the current price of $131.85. And I did this because, uh, again, the cloud is in the early stages of being part of the revenue. Uh, and I thought that it perhaps it might be given a little bit longer time frame uh, to get that up. Next slide, please. With, 
Alphabet doesn't pay a dividend, so the total return is only based on the compound annual return using the forecasted high PE. The projected relative value and the PEG ratio are within good ranges. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, Google is a large, moderate growth company. It's very well managed. Uh, they right now are fully priced, trading at the current PE of 27.9. Uh, its forecasted four-year average high PE is 28. It's a good buy up to $132.10, which will give you three to one upside downside and a 15% total return. Uh, the current price as of yesterday was $131.85, so it's slightly below that buy line. And it could be a good candidate for purchase, or you could maybe put it on a wait list and uh, check to see if you can get it at a little bit better price. Okay, thank you very much, Cheryl. And I think we're ready for Jonathan. Thank you. Okay, we're going to talk about Catalyst Pharmaceuticals. Um, I found this with a Better Investing's um, custom screen on with the Better Investing screening tools online. So I was searching specifically for a small company in the healthcare uh, sector. And you can take a look at my parameters that I use once the um, presentation is posted on our YouTube page. So Catalyst is a small biotech company, and basically what it does, it acquires the rights to commercialize drugs specifically for uh, rare neurological diseases. So Catalyst will actually do the legwork for the pharmaceutical companies. It will manufacture the drugs, it will advertise, market, it will distribute the drugs, and then it will get royalties uh, for, their, um, for the work that they provide. I'm going to talk about three drugs in their portfolio. One uh, is FERDAPS. FERDAPS is the only US approved treatment for Lambert Eaton Myasthenic Syndrome. This is also called LIMS for short. And if you look at the graphic illustration, you can see that this affects the muscle, muscle groups in the upper and lower extremity. So patients tend to have difficulties walking, climbing stairs, and rising from chairs. The FDA has given this designation for FERDAPS as an orphan drug exclusivity. Orphan drugs are those drugs that treat rare diseases. And the FDA has also expanded its indication for the pediatric population. Now, there's a huge market for um, FERDAPS. When you consider the, the number of patients that are affected, there's between 3,600 and 5,600 patients within the U.S. that are affected with uh, LEMS. Now, to put this in perspective, the drug itself costs $375,000 per person per year. So now the, the patients are not really paying that price, but that is the, the cost of the drug per person. So when you look at these numbers of the people that are affected, they're, they're small, but they're actually significant from a revenue perspective. So I put stars by the uh, categories where patients are diagnosed, but not yet treated with FERDAPS, and then those patients that are undiagnosed. So this represents about 4,000 potential patients for, um, that could potentially be treated with FERDAPS. There's another small subgroup of patients who have small cell lung cancer, and at the lower left, you can see I put an underline in red, where approximately 3% of small cell lung cancer patients are diagnosed with Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. And this represents approximately 1,000 new uh, LIMS patients a year. So Catalyst is also looking at expanding internationally, and they're starting with Japan and Canada. So Japan currently has no approved therapy for LIMS. There are about 1,200 patients that are diagnosed. Catalyst Pharmaceuticals is working with Dido Pharma, and Dido Pharma is anticipated to submit a new drug application by the end of this year. 
Canada has already uh, approved FERD apps in its country, and there are currently approximately about 300 people that are affected. The second drug is Ficompa. Ficompa uh, is used to treat seizure disorders. There are about three and a half million patients in the United States with active epilepsy. There are also about 150,000 new patients per year being diagnosed. So Ficompa is actually one of many, many drugs that are used to treat uh, seizure disorders. This, is, this slide really just uh, illustrates the contribution of both FERDAPS and Ficompa with total revenues. Now, Catalyst Pharmaceutical has been a profitable company since about 2019. Uh, this graph actually shows the first quarter of 2021 through the second quarter of 2023. And you can see that there is a rise in uh, revenues, primarily due to FERDAPS initially. Now, Ficompa, uh, Catalyst Pharmaceutical has obtained the licensing agreement uh, at the beginning of this year. And that's why you're starting to see this, uh, these yellow bars contributing significantly to uh, the total revenues for uh, Catalyst for, for this year. And this should continue going forward. The third drug is Vimorolone. Vimorolone is used to treat Duchenne muscular dystrophy. These patients are usually diagnosed in, in their younger years. And you can see that the majority of these patients are treated with steroids. There are many, many really bad side effects associated with steroids. Uh, and Vimorolone is classified as a dissociative anti-inflammatory steroid. And what this means is dissociative means that the, the drug itself has similar positive effects of reducing the inflammatory response without the side effects. So that is a huge benefit of this drug. The first in class uh, basically means that this is a new therapeutic approach to treating a disease. So there are many other inflammatory diseases that could from this drug once it has been approved. And you can see the FDA has granted uh, several designations to uh, the morolone. Uh, it's an orphan drug. Again, it treats rare diseases. It's also a fast track drug, meaning that it's designed to expedite the review process. And then it's been given that rare pediatric disease classification. The PDUFA date is uh, at the end of this uh, month, October 26, 2023. And what this means is that the FDA must complete its review process by this date. So this is one of the things that you're gonna have to consider uh, in the growth milestone if you're considering this company. Now, as many pharmaceutical companies, Catalyst Pharmaceuticals is also involved with many legal proceedings, specifically patent litigation. They have been very aggressive in the defense of its intellectual property rights, and they have largely been very successful in its cases. They currently have about $80 million in cash, and they have just recently filed with the SEC to raise up to $500 million. And this is significant because they, there's some growth on the near horizon that they are anticipating. They want to use this money potentially for acquisitions, clinical studies, manufacturing, marketing, and general working capital. And you can see some of their other accolades who they're America's best small companies. They, they were the 2022 company of the year, and they have a top five rank, uh, ranking in the biotech stocks. Again, I, now I excluded some outliers, and again, Catalyst Pharmaceuticals started to become a profitable company in around 2019. You can see the sales have been increasing, and analysts are also forecasting sales to continue to increase in the near future. Earnings per share has uh, somewhat of a zigzag appearance, but overall, it's increasing over the years and should continue to increase over the near future, too. The purple line below earnings per share is the free cash flow, and free cash flow has also been increasing. If you look at the recent quarterly figures, sales and earnings have been phenomenal the last quarter, and primarily, that's primarily due to the inclusion of FICOMPA 
uh, to their revenue stream. This is management scorecard. They have been doing an outstanding job. If you look at profit margins, 38.5% return on equity, 33.8%. Debt is essentially negligible. The tables at the bottom are, are a comparison of management with the industry and peer groups. And they have, again, they've been doing a fantastic job. Um, this is, I would consider a high quality uh, company at this point. Our spreadsheet uh, documents many of the analysts' projections over the next one to five years. And I'm getting averages for, for sales and earnings of 20.5 and 17.1% for sales and earnings, respectively. I use 18 and 15 for my forecast. And then keep in mind this uh, $30 high price for the future is what the analysts are projecting. And we'll look at that when I uh, analyze my high price. If you were to buy this company at the closing price of last Friday, uh, this could be considered a fair, uh, a fair price to pay for this company. But the current PE, 11.6, almost comparable to what the average PE is, 13.2. The high PE average is 20 and the low PE average is 6.4. And you can see I use an average high PE of 18, so I'm getting a calculated forecasted high price of 36.5. And we're getting total returns ranging between 16.2 and 25.6. So. If, again, if this is the company that you're interested in, there are certain uh, milestones that you want to pay attention to. One is um, with respect to the more loan, you want to monitor this uh, uh, date of October 26, 2023. Uh, they are anticipating approval of the more loan and uh, an expected launch uh, early next year. With respect to FERD apps, um, keep in mind that uh, the pharmaceutical company in Japan is expected to file an NDA by the end of this year. And then you want to continue to monitor the company itself to see how it diversifies its product portfolio. So Catalyst Pharmaceuticals is a small, fast-growing company. It's very well managed and it's fairly valued at this point. So at the very least, I would su suggest it would be a wonderful candidate for a watch list. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, so we went through all these relatively fast. Um, and so we're now going to sort of go back through this. And Cheryl, while I have you, I, I've been able to finally get on my computer. I've been doing this all on my phone. So if you make me an organizer, that will help. Thank you. Okay. I may have a little bit of a lag time here. But anyway, so if we can just sort of talk about each one. Um, Cheryl, do you want to tell us why you sort of picked this location for? Uh, Alphabet? Well, I mean, Google and now Alphabet has been around for a long time, so they are certainly not a new company, uh, but they are getting into so many different new areas and uh, being able to do it well because they are a, a large company that has uh, the resources to do it. Um, so I believe they still have some explosive, uh, quite a bit of explosive growth left in them. Okay. Uh, Greg, you want to tell us why you have that location for Danaher? Sure. I think, you know, Danaher is a solid company. They've made a lot of money over the years. They are uh, cash rich, but because of, uh, I think, changes in particularly healthcare with their most recent growth being the result of COVID and also with them dropping, uh, you know, $5 billion by the spinoff of one of their companies, I see them as more, group, more of a in the mature growth area rather than something explosive, but yet I think there's more uh, growth, but I don't see them as being stabilized at this point in time. Okay, and I picked Intuitive for that location. I still think it's explosive. It's not as big as it was a couple of years ago, um, but there's still a lot of growth in terms of what's going on with robotic surgery and how much more they're going to continue to grow. Um, so it can be in this area for a very long time. And in their area, they dominate. So I really like them in this area. Uh, and now, Jonathan, tell us why you picked that location for Catalyst. 
Well, it was very interesting that they filed to raise uh, a half a billion dollars. So there's clearly a, a lot of positive aspects of this company that management is looking forward to. Uh, with the recent addition of FICOMPA to the portfolio, that's had a significant growth. And also the international expansions, specifically of FERDAPs. Uh, once this company really starts to grow internationally, I think there's going to be huge growth potential there too. And the anticipation of the Mora loan, the Mora loan itself has a lot of potential uh, to, to have to help this company to grow significantly. So I think it's in a, this very early explosive growth period at this point. Very good. Okay, well, we've been doing a lot of chatting. I think it's now time for us to go to our next slide and actually let people vote. So let's go to the next slide. And then Cheryl, if you can you release a poll or does Jonathan have to do that? I will trying to see what I can do here. Give me a minute. As you can tell folks, we've had some technology problems tonight. There we go. It's up. Now's your time to vote. Okay, we're at about 30% uh, of you voting. Up to 60. 74, can we get a, one or two more? Looks like we may be stopping. Ah, got another vote, Maybe uh, there we go, got another vote. One more, let's see if we get one more vote. Go ahead and uh, close the poll. Okay. And there we go. We liked Catalyst. Uh, you know, Jonathan just has that smooth talking voice that that's the reason why everyone likes it. That and also it's a really, really solid company. Um, anyway, uh, those are, are good stuff to take a look at um, and the like. So let's do this. Uh, we can take a look. Uh, has anyone, let's see. Uh, all right, we yeah we had some technology things here that people were asking about. Uh, yeah, there have been some lag stuff going on here. I don't know what's going on. Um, so anyway, if anyone has any questions, you can certainly raise your hand, and we will open things up for you um, and the like. Anyone has any comments or they want to talk about any of these particular stocks? Come on, Rob, you're usually always wanting to discuss something. <laughs> you want to raise your hand and tell us something? I'm unmuting you, Robert, so you can be able to sit there and uh, I know you're not shy. So go ahead and hit the microphone, open yourself up. Let's hear from you. Or not. <laughs> Boy, everyone is. Oh, there okay. we go. How are you? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I uh, uh, corroborated or co collaborated uh, with uh, Greg on Danaher. Um, so anything you want to add to what he said? Uh, uh, no, no, no. I that's, uh, that's surprising. You're normally not that quiet. I try to be. <laughs> okay no that was uh those were some interesting uh interesting companies to study tonight uh, were, and knowing you i know you're going to do a lot of work on that so that's good and that's what we want to do so do we have any other questions i'm going to um, i'm going to mute you again uh rob go ahead there's an interesting statement from uh helen uh, that Xerox and IBM models in the old days. I wonder if she would like to open the mic and uh, explain uh, that statement. There you go. In the early days, and even when I was uh, first getting into corporate work in the 70s and 80s, I remember Xerox and IBM salesmen saying, Oh, we just sell the. We we don't make money selling the pro the the hardware. We make money selling the stuff that are add-ons like paper and ink and things like that. And and that comment related to 
the question, the comment that someone was uh, explaining about selling the robotics. They're not the they make the money on the add-ons. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, thank you very much, Helen. And uh, I still remember you from when I started my first club and you came to help us as a director. So thank you very much. We're passing it on. Back in so. the day. <laughs> okay. Any other questions that we have there? Uh, David is making a comment about a PDF uh, for sex. Seth Klarman's book, Margin of Safety. All right, here, I'll, I'll unmute him. Go ahead. So, uh, David, if you yourself muted, so click on your microphone and you can talk away. Yes, uh, <clears throat> just very, very much toward the end. Uh, I think maybe it was your desktop, but it had a PDF icon for Seth Klarman's book, Margin of Safety. I just wonder where you found that. I had tried to find that myself, but it always comes up in kind of a sketchy way on on the internet and I didn't want to but I just wondered if somebody had found that uh, copy of that book as a PDF um, I'll tell you what uh, if you send me an email and you can use the um, digging dot into dot bi at gmail I think I have one that will work and I can be able to shoot it off to you that'd be so great PDF, I, I really it's not the book because the book itself for people who don't know is like two thousand dollars right I, just the pdf somebody made me made a copy or something so mm -hmm. i don't know anyway uh, i really appreciate being part of this as a guest tonight i'm from boise idaho so i'm a long way away but uh how'd you find us well uh i get on the manifest uh investing site and yeah. also on uh, uh i'm a member of better investing so but I don't have really a, an active club out here, so I've been able to visit. So I appreciate it very much. Glad to have you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh -huh. And anytime you want to uh, visit any of our uh, virtual model clubs, you are more than welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it. So again, I'm going to mute you now. Uh, you muted yourself, but um, let me uh, again, David, just send an email at that digging dot into bi. Uh, and I will get to, I uh, will see if I have it. And if I do, I'll share it with you. So I think I do. All right, so any other questions or should we just keep going? Uh, Carol Cudahy um, has a, a, an interesting statement about uh, Catalyst. Well, Carol, to... I've, uh, I've unmuted you, so you're muted on your side. So go ahead and unmute yourself and let us know. Uh, yes, I just saw that the CEO plans to retire at the end of the year. I'm just wondering, what impact does that have on a company when you have a major um, um, VP or whatever uh, resigning? Does that cause some disruption or is it, you know, depend on who else is um, in the management uh, basket? Yeah, I guess I, yeah, I, yeah, I understand. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with the CEO uh, retired. I didn't get that information, so that's news to me. But that that usually is a red flag when you have uh, management uh, changes. So that's definitely something to consider. Uh, also, their longevity and how long they have actually participated within the company, too. So I think okay. that is a, that's definitely a red flag that I would be concerned with. And that might be another reason why I would put it on a watch list and just wait and see uh, what the new management how the new management functions going forward. Thank you. Okay. If that's it, let's keep going on. I don't see any more questions. Does anyone else? Cheryl, do you no, see any more? That's all I okay. saw. All right, let's keep going. There's a picture of us at our last virtual bank. And if you want to be part of this, um, you don't have to be part of the DC regional chapter, but just come to this location. Um, uh, let's see, it, it should be the next slide after this. Let's go up one more slide. There we go. So, uh, yes, so uh, just sign up here. I'm sure most of you are because you are getting our emails. Thank you, Carol. You do a great job at that. And um, we'll be, we won't inundate you and you'll just get general education information. And we seem to, the, both the book club and uh, stuff with uh, this webinar are really it. And then our upcoming SSG class. Next slide.
So Jonathan, you want to tell us about how um, all the great benefits of volunteering? Absolutely. Uh, Better Investing is a, a wonderful community. It's a community that's run by hundreds of volunteers and that's what makes it so successful too. So there are many advantages of being a volunteer with Better Investing. Um, uh, you can learn a lot of new skills. You're working side by side with fellow like-minded um, uh, individuals who are really concerned about improving their financial aspects, their discounts uh, for uh, national uh, conventions and complimentary subscriptions. So there are a host of uh, wonderful benefits of being a volunteer. And we always encourage everyone to try to participate as much as you can. And you can find more information on the Better Investing website also. Thanks. Very good. Next slide. I think I'm having a little bit of a lag time. So if we're on slide, there we go. All right, we don't have any, um, uh, the, they're kind of behind at uh, headquarters in terms of putting out the featured stocks for November. So we don't know what the stock to study and undervalued feature are, are going to be. And we haven't selected our uh, two other featured stocks, but we will be here on November 6th. That will be our third anniversary. Uh, tonight was our 36th different webinar. Uh, most, but not all of them, are up on that YouTube channel, and hopefully we'll have this up uh, later on tonight, um, and all, uh, or either that or in the morning. Uh, you can share those with other people, uh, folks that uh, are in your club, or you want to be able to talk about uh, stuff, because to me, the whole idea of being in a club is to be able to talk about stocks and not to be able to worry about your procedures, but the procedures are important. Still, learning about and talking about stocks is really where we like to sort of focus on. So keep that in mind. And I think we have one more slide and I think we're done. And that is uh, the link for, uh, again, oh, oh, I'm sorry, we have the manifest. I have these things up on manifest, so I will update the dashboard with the latest selections, uh, but you can sort of track it for, uh, we had break it out by each year. And I've also done it by those that are undervalued selections and, um, uh, stock to study. So I've done it a couple different ways. You can just find it if you have a manifest subscription there. Otherwise, next slide. And again, another reason to download these things is these are all the hyperlinks uh, for all the stuff at manifest. Again, you don't have to be a, a member of manifest. You can just take a look at this. This is in the public dashboards. Again, this is all faux money, but uh, you can see what we're doing uh, and keep that in mind uh, going forward. Next slide. I think this may be our final one. Yep. So we are up on YouTube. Please see us there. Please subscribe. Please like uh, each individual um, uh, video that helps with uh, Google's algorithm. Google owns uh, uh, YouTube. And we will see you next month when we dig into the BI. Thank you very much for coming. Good night, all.